You're listening to the Sisters in Loss podcast, a faith-based podcast that spotlights Black women who replace silence with storytelling around pregnancy and infant loss and infertility. Black women experience miscarriage and stillbirth four to five times more likely than white women, according to the NIH and CDC. Whether you've experienced a miscarriage, infant loss, stillbirth, are trying to conceive or have an infertility diagnosis, you will learn about resources and strategies to heal, gain clarity, peace, hope, and find an empowering path forward after loss. I'm your host, Erica M. McAfee, and you will hear me interview sisters in loss who have healed from such a painful and traumatic experience by sharing their testimonies and stories to inspire and help others turn their pain into their purpose. Now let's get started. Welcome to episode 232 of the Sisters in Loss podcast. All month long, we will feature some of our favorite episodes around different topics. Today's topic is all about how to move forward after miscarriage. In today's episode, we are featuring episode 38, which features um, Raina Campbell, who is the host of the Dreams in Drive podcast, who shares her miscarriage story and the cost of miscarriage um, from her feature with L.com. After her miscarriage in 2016, Raina found those hospital bills quickly adding up to thousands of dollars, even with insurance. So in this episode, Raina takes us back on how she started Dreams and Drive, grieving the loss of her baby, and how she got featured on L.com and really wanted to share the light around the financial burden of losing a child. Raina has since given birth since this episode to our rainbow baby, and we're so happy for you, Raina. So congratulations. But here's Raina Campbell with episode 38. Go back and listen to the full episode in detail. I just have these weird habits that I picked up thinking that it would help me, like, keep my mind off of things. So individually, I just felt like after it happened, there was just seen this, this, this empty feeling inside of me and just this pain that I wasn't talking about. And it was weird to have my podcast. So I'm the type of person when I'm in any type of, like, traumatic moment or when I'm sad, I need to channel that energy into something else. Mm-hmm. So I felt like I just started really focusing all my efforts, all my energies into my podcast because it became my baby in a way. And it was Mm. also hard for me because the end of my pregnancy, actually three days before, she told me she was pregnant. And she's like one of my best friend's cousins. She's like my real cousin. We're also like best friends. And so at that moment, I felt so much of a relief because I felt, wow, I won't have to do this alone. Um, You know, I have like my best friend with me, my family. She'll support me. So her pregnancy lasted. And then like a month later, my best friend, like from high school was pregnant with her second child and she didn't want to tell me because um she just didn't know how I would take it so she ended up telling me like 15 when she was like 15 weeks I'm like girl you're looking a little round what's happening right. so it was just it was hard although I was very supportive of both of them it I just still couldn't shake the fact that wow like all three of our children were supposed to be you know born around the time um it, it also was tougher for Andrew because like the baby was supposed to be born like his birthday and it was just like a really in our relationship I felt like we both just kept trying to be strong for each other but we didn't necessarily like talk about our feelings so Mm -hmm. much Mm -hmm. it was just uh oh my gosh okay now what let's not talk about it okay I'm sad like we didn't really like I know this probably sounds weird but like we we acknowledged it but it was something that we didn't really talk about like on the daily but because I hadn't told my family, I told my best friends, he became the person that, like, when I had those, like, I broke down, I could only go to him because nobody else really knew. So kudos to Elle for featuring women like yourself in a mainstream platform to talk about miscarriage. So what was your encouragement or your motivation for actually putting yourself out there on a national platform like that? You know what, because I kept thinking to myself, like, one of the things with Dreams and Drives, I interview a lot of people, they're sharing their stories, they're being so raw, so emotional about moments of, of, you know, triumph that they've had to go through in their own stories. And I kept feeling like a part of my story, I was not being truthful to my audience about. Not that I wasn't being truthful, I just wasn't really revealing a real part, like a a part of my life that could be, but it didn't because I was able to push through it, but it still pains me, you know what I mean? And I just kept thinking like, 
I want to talk about it. I want to talk about it, but I'm so nervous. I'm so nervous. I don't know what people will think about, you know, think about it. And, um, and I realized it wasn't only my story to tell. Like, I didn't want to, like, when I asked, he didn't necessarily want to talk about it in such a plat- uh, public platform. So I was respectful of that as well. But I had this gnawing feeling that there's so many other people out there who who are going through things like this. And I remember one of my guests was on the show and she's a very emotional part of her own journey. And we had a whole discussion where she she told me about her own miscarriage that she had. And she told me that she never told anyone about that before. But I never at that point was ready to share my story. But then I felt I, I felt kind of guilty about it because it's not that she didn't want me to. I just want something that happens to a lot of women. Um, but I just felt really nervous, really shameful about it. And it, this was such a stroke of luck, Erica. It was such a stroke of luck. And just like, I believe in signs. And I don't know if it was like God telling me this is, you should do this. this. Here is your platform to do it. But I'm subscribed to a network called Help a Reporter Out. Have you heard of that before? No, I haven't. Well, it's been- it's really like this program. It's not a program. It's an email list, basically. It's called Harrow. Help a reporter out. You can sign up for it, and you'll get notifications. There's different types of, like, lists. They, they come out, like, in the afternoon and the night, and basically it's, like, um, it's kind of like a directory of reporters who are looking for sources for their stories. Oh, okay. So I'm on the list, and I normally need emails. I just delete them. But for some reason this day in October, I said, Raina, open this Help a Reporter Out email. And I opened it, and I was just scrolling through, like, the lifestyle section, and it said, I'm looking for women to talk about their miscarriage story. Mm-hmm. And something just told me to reply to the query, and I replied and said, hey, I would love to learn more about this. And then the woman responded to me and said, hey, this is, we're from L. We're looking for women to share their miscarriage story. Would you be interested in me um, connecting with a reporter? And I said, okay. And that's how it all started. Like, if I hadn't read that email it wouldn't, like, I wouldn't have had this whole experience since then. And I spoke to the reporter, and she told me how she wanted to focus, uh, they were doing something on the cost of being a woman, and how it comes to miscarriages, one of the things that people don't often talk about is the actual financial side of it. And for me personally, that really resonated with me because that has been my biggest, like, outside of the personal struggle, the financial side of it and the whole insurance thing and everything, that it just has been a nightmare for me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's part of my story that I, I really felt like I could speak to. And I was so nervous about it. And I told her I would get back to her. And something just told me, Raina, do it. Yeah. Like, stop. You you spent so long. When you were pregnant, you were worried about what people would think about you. Afterwards, when you wanted to talk to people, you were worried about what people would think about you. Like, this is a sign. I'm going to help a lot of other women who have, you know, who are or have been dealing with these issues. So I said yes. They came out to my house. We did an interview. And the um, the final video went out in December. And I think to date, like, it probably has, like, over 365,000 video of views right now. Wow. It's really, really well pleased to showing how... First of all, miscarriage is never talked about within our community, especially. And also, just there's there's a whole other component, like the financial burden that it can also cause in women as well. So that that's what really, um, I think I just was, I was just tired of not talking about it and tired of carrying around the shame and just realize, you know, like I'm an adult, I'm a woman. There are so many people who are out here struggling with this. And as I found out, you know, following this, so many people like people in my own life who were very close to me came out and said that hey I've had a miscarriage or you mm-hmm. know I've had this happen to me and I was just so amazed like you know the things that we hold inside right and little do we know just by sharing it how much relief and how much we could help somebody else The next episode we have featured today is episode 102, which features Crystal Justice. Crystal was raised in a Christian-based faith home, and you really wanted to make sure she talked about how she navigated her journey to becoming a mother at 38. She found out she was pregnant. She ended up losing the baby, getting a DNC. And in this episode, within this clip, she's really going to talk about what happened that day after she found herself having to go through and actually get the surgery to remove this baby when all she ever wanted 
was a baby. Um, definitely listen to this as there is some thoughts of suicide ideation and her healing journey. So I want you all to just really listen to how she was able to move forward, even with her mental health challenges and with therapy. So here is Crystal Justice from episode 102. And you want to go back and listen to the full episode in its entirety. And I just remember her saying, Crystal, I'm really sorry. And I just remember the most piercing cry that I've ever had in my life. And I just, uh, I just, just thinking about it gives me chills because I, I can sometimes hear my own cry. And I was pretty devastated. My boyfriend was devastated. He'd never gone through it before. I just thought everything was going to be okay. And uh, before that appointment, we got the results, like, you know, the levels and they test your levels, the HCG, everything was looking perfect. My progesterone was high because that was the issue as well. Everything was looking good. So I never thought that I was going to hear that news. And so we were pretty devastated. And I, I definitely was devastated. I, I felt betrayed by God. I couldn't understand it. Like, why I wait all this time? I'm 38 years old. And, well, 39 by the time that I lost the baby because I had a birthday. I'm 39. I'm excited. It's never happened before. And this is the fate. This is what happened. I just felt betrayed. I felt useless. I didn't feel like a woman. I felt broken. I I felt I didn't feel human. I remember telling my mother that when I became pregnant, I felt like I, I had a purpose. And, you know, she would say that I, I shouldn't feel that way, that you have a purpose without being a mom. But I, I'm not going to take that statement back. I did. When I became pregnant, it, it, everything became about my child. I was eating better, drinking more water. Everything just became, I want to see my baby. So I, I did. I felt like I had a purpose. And so I felt like it was snatched away from me and I had no choice. And I like to be in control. And you quickly learn that you really have no control of it. You can try, you can do everything, quote unquote, right. But what's going to happen is going to happen. And that was devastating for me in itself, because like I said, I like control. I've, you know, my career, my education, I, I've been able to, to do it. And here, here comes this and something that I've wanted literally all of my life. I remember being a, a five-year-old little girl saying I wanted to be a mom and there was nothing that I could do to stop it. And so I remember at the doctor's office, she asked, the doctor asked if I wanted to do the DNC or take the pill to complete the miscarriage at home. I remember asking, you know, which procedure would be easier or quicker. And she said, like, the DNC. So I chose the DNC. I didn't want to be at home and not knowing when, the, when it would start. And I remember asking God, like, please don't let me start bleeding at home. I knew I couldn't handle that. I don't know how I knew that I couldn't handle it, but I knew that I couldn't. I knew I couldn't see that. So, and thank God I did not that entire weekend. I, I didn't bleed. I just, you know, kind of laid around. But unfortunately, I, I became extremely depressed before the procedure. Unfortunately, the DNC, the procedure was on my boyfriend's birthday. So I felt terrible about that. But again, no choice, no control. <laughs> so just, I felt terrible about that. So I became very, very depressed. And I remember telling my boyfriend that I was going to complete suicide. I was serious. I was very serious. I was very matter of fact about it. He couldn't believe it. He'd already experienced that. His brother completed suicide years ago when he was younger. And I meant it. And, and I, I'm, I won't try to cover that up. I meant it. I was very serious about it. And, and I just felt like there was no use. You know, I had done my career. I'd been a great mother. I was sorry, a great daughter, a great friend. And I just wanted to be a mother. And that was snatched from me. So I just felt like, what's the point? I wasn't trying to hurt him. I wasn't trying to hurt my mother, my friends, or my father. I just, I was done. I was tired. I was heartbroken. And so I recall, because he works nights, and so I recall him not going to work that weekend, you know, those nights. I remember him staying with me. And then the night before the procedure, because the procedure's on the Tuesday, so that Monday night, I remember taking pills. I was home alone. I remember taking pills because, you know, I had antidepressants and Ambien because I'd already had insomnia before. So I had those. And I remember because we don't drink, but I remember there was like some type of old beer in the fridge. 
And I remember getting that in the, in like the ambient and the antidepressants. I remember getting those and taking it. I don't remember much else. I remember being on the phone talking to my boyfriend and then somehow I remember him being in the house. I'm assuming I let him in, didn't have a key. So I'm assuming I let him in. And now that I think of it, I remember arguing with him and being in the kitchen and attempting to take more pills. I don't remember much after that. Sometimes when I'm like driving now, I'll get little flashbacks, but I don't remember much. And then the next day was the procedure. And of course he went with me. My mother was there. And so I had the procedure, came home and I didn't really remember everything that happened the night before. And my mother mentioned to me that, you know, it's, it's, she could tell something was wrong with my boy, my boyfriend, but she just figured it was, you know, me losing the baby. She figured he was just grieving. She had no clue. She did tell me that she remembers that when she came over to my house and he opened the door, she was like, oh, I thought you were meeting us there. And he gave her some weird excuse. And she thought it was strange. Like, wait, what are you, what are you doing here? But again, she just kind of, you know, flicked it off or whatever. And so after the procedure was on a Tuesday, I remember arguing with him again on that Thursday about, you know, like there was no help. He was like, I think you need to go to, you know, see a therapist. And I am a therapist, but I was like, no, there's no need for that. And again, there, there goes me being matter of fact, you know, and he was just hurt. And, you know, it was a very, very rough time uh, for he and I just, you know, on top of, of, of losing the baby, then it was my suicide attempt. Maybe a week later, we went to therapy. I did make a therapy appointment. And right before the therapy appointment, he gave me more details on, on what I tried to do. And I was devastated. You know, my therapist, I, she was wide eyed about it once, you know, he began to tell her details. So apparently when he did come over the night before, I was basically out of my mind because I'd been drinking and taking Ambien and antidepressants. Apparently I went in the kitchen. I took more pills, like a, a whole bottle. It makes sense now when I see there was, when I came back, there was an empty bottle on the, on the counter. Like things are making sense once he started to explain. And, you know, he told me about, you know, making me vomit, about calling my best friend. And I remember my best friend saying, yeah, things were really bad, but nobody gave me details. And so I think I was very upset in the therapy session of like, why didn't anyone say anything? But then at the same time, I thought like, wow, I really, I really wanted to die. and. It's amazing because, again, I am a therapist, so I know what to do. I know what to say. I help people. Uh, you know, that's my role in life. And But at this particular time in my life, I couldn't help myself. It humbles you. That's one thing I can say. It humbles you. If, if you think you have it all together, losing a child, a miscarriage will remind you of just how human and how fragile you are. I am very thankful that I did not complete suicide I you know as much as I question God I still want to be here you know it's only been about two months now but I no longer feel like I don't want to live and I thank God that I that I that I didn't get my wish because I still have a lot to live for I still want to try and be a mom but I am dealing with a lot you know I'm back at work I ended up having to take some time off of work you know without pay because I was just mentally I could not do it and ironically enough at the time I worked in suicide prevention so I I went back to work and I answered a call to the crisis line and this guy's on the phone and he's basically saying he's going through a divorce and he's hurting and he doesn't want to live and in my mind I wanted to say yeah I get it but I couldn't I'm at work I'm supposed to help save lives not encourage someone to complete suicide. But it was in that moment that I knew that I could not be at work. I ended up having an anxiety attack at work. So I had to go back to my psychiatrist and she filled out the paperwork. And so I was off of work for about two weeks, didn't have enough leave. And so it was without pay. And, and for the first time in my life, I had to literally choose me. You know, I've, I've always been, you know, I won't, I wouldn't say money hungry or anything like that, but I just, you know, I was kind of raised you get your career going, you're able to take care of yourself. That's what you do in life. And especially as a black woman, you make sure you can take care of yourself. You don't have to depend on anyone. So I've, I've never imagined 
not being able to work and, and not getting paid and, and not quite sure where the money was going to come from. But my friends and my family, they supported me and I had no choice. And one thing I, that was when I literally had to a hundred percent depend on God. I, I think we say that and we quote scriptures and we say God is in control. You know, it, it sounds wonderful, but there may come a point in your life where that has to be true. And for the first time in my life, I literally had to rely completely on God, rely that rely on God that he would have other people to take care of me because I could not, I couldn't do it. I could not go to work. I could not be super social worker and recover. You know, I was still physically in pain, mentally in pain. And here I am at work trying to help someone else. It, no, it just, it just wasn't going to work. So that's basically the, the story of, of the loss and where I am and what happened. And, and for me, I think it's trying to deal with a miscarriage and a suicide attempt. That's, you know, it's been rough. I don't know. It's, I feel like, like why, why would I do that to myself? Go through a miscarriage and then on top of that, have to deal with being that low in life. But it happened and it happened for a reason. I hope that, you know, someone can hear my story and maybe they'll be able to relate and just know that it does get better. I'm only two months out, so I, I, I can't give this big ray of hope speech because I don't know. You know, it's some days I'm fine and some days I am not fine. I have a lot of anxiety now. Should I go on? I don't want to talk too much. No, no. Okay. I, you know, everything that you're saying is, you know, questions that I would ask. So tell us about really just kind of how you are navigating this role now that you're really you're you know you, you took some time off at work now you're back mm-hmm. at work and mm-hmm. you know there there are triggers all around you yeah so how are you navigating that role so that you won't take yourself back to that place to that dark deep place that you were at and talk well, about your how your anxiety plays into that as well Okay. Well, fortunately, it's it, the story is just like something you read out of a book. Three days after the miscarriage, I ended up doing a phone interview for another position. And amazingly, I felt like I did great in that interview. And then as soon as I hung up the phone, I boohooed. I cried. I cried. I don't know how I got myself together to do this interview. They called me that morning and said, can you interview at one o'clock this afternoon over the phone? I was like, yes. Um, so I did that. And while I'm at work for this, when I'm working in suicide prevention, as I'm typing the email to say, I can't do this right now, I get a phone call and the position is offered to me. So I accept and I said, well, I'm going on FMLA. Is that going to be a problem? They're like, yeah, you know, you can start in two or three weeks. I'm like, okay. So even, even at my lowest, God still showed up. So I am still in, you know, in the mental health field. I'm not directly working with suicide prevention anymore. I'm back to doing individual and group therapy. And so self-care is very important. I know that's, you know, very trendy now, very popular to say, but it's 100% truth for me. I have definitely learned the power in the word no. Like, no, I can't go out this weekend or, you know, no, I can't talk about your problems too. I'm having a rough day myself. I've definitely learned how to say no. I've definitely learned to speak up and to say, hey, I'm having a really rough day. My anxiety is is definitely different. I, I don't feel too comfortable around people for too long. Like if I go out, it's for a couple of hours. And then I'm ready to come back home. And I've been reading how that's normal because I didn't know if it's normal or not. I feel a lot safer around my mother or my boyfriend versus by myself. And I don't know what I, I don't know exactly what I fear, but that's just how it is for right now. And so, you know, and sometimes it'll hit. Sometimes I'm driving to work and I'll just burst out into tears. I'm like, where'd that come from? Or, and I don't know, I know it sounds quote unquote crazy. But for a minute there, I would go on Instagram and look at like the pages with a lot of babies on it and try to find a baby that I thought that would look like me or my boyfriend trying to put a a face to my child. That was the strangest thing that I would do, but I would do it. And and I'm honest about it. 
And my, you know, my, I told my best friend and she was like, okay, we have to get you to stop doing this because you're literally torturing yourself. So I'm getting better with that. But for a while, I would do that every night. I would do that every night. And then I would send the pictures to my boyfriend and he would call and like, what are you doing? Go to, first of all, go to bed. And why are you up looking at baby pictures? But it was just, it was trying to make sense of it all. I did listen to when you had the online conference for women who, who've lost children. And I remember, you know, I don't know if it was you or someone else saying, you know, naming your child. We did get the remains tested. And so everything was fine. You know, with, with, with our, it was a boy so with our son's chromosomes. Everything was fine. So we did, you know, we decided to give him a name. And so at least I have a name for our child, but I don't have a face. And that, that still gets to me. I, I wonder every day, what, what would he look like? Would it look like me? Would it look like him? Would he have been tall? I'm, I'm assuming he would have been tall, but it, it, it still gets to me. I'm not, you know, I will never pretend like I'm completely okay and over it, that I don't have moments. And, you know, I remember my first cycle after the, the miscarriage and just sobbing, just sobbing. Like I, I thought I was going to have at least nine to 10 months <laughs> of not going through this anymore. And here we are again. So it's just self-care, just self-care and learning the word no and being okay with the no. And when someone goes, oh, girl, I mean, you can at least try. No. And if they can't understand, that's fine. That's okay. And I tell them all the time, well, be thankful that you don't know what this feels like. Be thankful that you have no idea what it's like to have a miscarriage, have a suicide attempt, have to go back to work and pick up your life and carry on and go help other people. And then try to still have friends and family. So I'm just, I'm very comfortable with the word no now, very comfortable with it. And and I'm becoming more comfortable with myself because you, like I said, that word no, sometimes it pushes people away. And then that's fine. I want anyone to who's listening, you know, it's fine. It's fine to say no. And if the people don't understand, then that's just how it is. Those who truly love you will understand. And they'll support you. They'll support the no. I, I had a really good friend who was having a baby shower. And I just couldn't go. And I remember calling my best friend saying, am I not a good friend? And she's like, please don't go to that baby shower. Like, it, send a gift and stay home. And that's what I did. And, and that's what I needed to do. I knew I, I shouldn't go to a baby shower and cry and, and take the attention off the mom. It, was, it should be a celebration, not people trying to contain my emotions. So I hope I haven't said too much, but that's, that's, how, I've, that's how I've been dealing with it. I, I do go to therapy. I still do that. I journal a lot. I journal a lot more. I am on antidepressants. I'm not ashamed of that. It's it's what I do to keep to function. I, I have to take, you know, anxiety pills at night so I can sleep. I don't want that to be my life. I, I want to eventually get off the medication. But right now that's where I am. And so I'm doing what I have to do so that I can live and so that I can take care of myself. Absolutely. So thank you so much for sharing that and sharing kind of where you are now in your journey. So really, what do you think that besides, you know, really going to therapy and really taking your medication, really, what do you think also has helped you in on your grieving process? You know, any other tools or resources that you think you've used to help you as you continue to grieve and, you know, kind of Dismiss all of those suicidal and those intuitions that you've had, you know, kind of mm-hmm. what other things have you used that can help some other women out there that are very, very, very new in their grief as well? Having friends, having friends who, you know, who understand helps, you know, people to call and still check on you to let you know that, you know, you're still loved, you know, that they've always loved you for you. So that, that definitely helped, you know, and I've, I've, you know, there's some people who will surprise me. I feel like they haven't reached out or, and that's fine too. Again, it's, it's a process and those who are meant to stay, they, they do that. They stay. So friends have definitely helped. My partner has definitely helped. He's been a great support yet. It was difficult for him, especially in the beginning with my suicide attempt. You know, he shut down. It was rough. I wasn't sure if we were going to make it, but once we got through that hurdle, I feel like we've become even closer. Lastly, the episode that we're featuring is episode 120 with Sharita Thompson. 
definitely this episode has to do with just the devastation of experiencing a miscarriage while being away from home, having to be um, go through this miscarriage um, alone, angry and frustrated. And in this episode, Sharita really takes us back on her grief journey, how she really went towards her journey towards healing, how her faith and her prayer really helped her conceive her rainbow baby after a month after her miscarriage, and really how she is helping encouraging other mothers. So here is Sharita Thompson, but definitely go back and listen to episode 120 in its entirety. On my way home, I was just, I was devastated and I was just, I was sad. I was just, and I just couldn't wait to get home. I got to Iowa and my husband picked me up again. He, my husband just, you know, embraced me. It's okay. We'll get through it. No worries. Man, I just bawled my eyes out all the way home. And I just remember walking into the house and just putting all my stuff down and just crying and saying how sorry I am. And But something in that moment struck me. You did not pray. This entire process, I never once stopped to pray and just seek God. I, I was just so caught up in my own feelings and my own um, emotions and what I think my husband might be thinking or feeling, even though he said, it's okay, we will get through it. And right then and there, I said to my husband, I need some time. I need, I need a few moments by myself. And, you know, I, I picked up my Bible and I got in my car and we have a lake, maybe about a good 10 minutes away from my house. And I just, I drove to the lake and I, I just, I just opened my Bible and just began reading and praying and reading and praying. I don't know how long I stayed there. It probably was an hour, but I just started beseeching God and saying, why? Why allow this? Why allow this? Why put me through this? And God is so merciful and God is so understanding and God is so compassionate that even when we question him because of a lack of faith, he still shows compassion and love even in that moment. And right then, you know, the Holy Spirit reminded me that God's plan is perfect. He said that he does not give us more than we can bear. And his plans are perfect for us. And somehow I was reassured that what I'm going through right now, even though I'm hurting and God does not like to see us sad, it was okay. It was going to be okay. I would be okay because his plans are perfect. I sat down and I meditated on those words and I meditated on them and all the promises. My faith in him was restored in that short moment. In that short moment, I was reminded that God loves me. In that short moment, I was reminded that God is going to take care of me and I'm going to be okay. And I drove home. I got back in my car. And as I was driving home, I began to call my friends and my family who I had shared the news with because they were just as excited for us. And whenever, and for each person that I spoke with, the shock of hearing my news kind of threw them into, oh, Cher, I'm so sorry. But I would stop them and I would tell them, there's nothing to be sorry about because I am okay. Because God says, I will be okay. I am not sad, so you don't have to be sad for me. You don't have to tiptoe around the conversations with me because I can really talk to you this way and know that God's plan is perfect. And, you know, I call everyone up and I share with them. And that was it. I know that, um, you know, it, I think because of my experiences coming up as a child, I had to learn to trust God wholeheartedly. And I had experienced so many losses prior to the loss of my baby that I was strong enough and faithful enough to believe that if God said, you're going to be okay, I could trust that I will be okay. 
And I think that was what helped me in that moment to know that God's plan is perfect for my life and I would be okay. I had a doctor's visit the following Monday and she suggested or recommended that I wait at least a month or two (laughs) before trying to conceive again. This was July when I lost the baby. I conceived my second child in August, literally the next month. That baby just turned five this past Wednesday. I am also a mother of two other children, James, who is two, and he'll be three this September, and Jade, who will be one this coming June. So it's been an amazing journey with God and I'm grateful that I can take a step back and look at his promises and trust what he says he will do. <laughs> That's kind of my story. <laughs> awesome. I love that. So can you share with us your healing journey? How did you heal and go through those, you know, five steps of grief as you were preparing to you know, conceive again, you know, thinking about trying again to have another child. Take us back on that journey. The thing about it is, I think the initial shock for me was, you know, that kind of disbelief, like, why would, why would God allow me to lose the baby? It's that kind of moment where you're not sure, you don't want to, you know, you don't want to believe that you have lost the baby. You want to hold on to the fact that because in, I mean, six weeks, there's already um, a fetal heartbeat. So here I am nine weeks into it. And, you know, I'm reading all these stuff and I'm looking at all the little cute fruits. Oh, he's a grapefruit this week. He's a, he's a great this week. And so that excitement, when you're told that you no longer have that child in your stomach, You don't want to believe that. It's a hard thing to believe and to accept. But again, in that moment when I was in Florida, though I was angry more at myself than I was at God, I was still able to hold up. I I guess I want to say, because my husband kind of reassured me that it was okay. He wasn't mad at me. I think that for me was kind of what I held on to, even though. I was still angry at myself thinking that it's my fault because I traveled when I was so early into my pregnancy. And then, you know, like I said, I didn't really stop to pray to God. So I didn't have much to hold on to. It was just more my emotional, um, emotional roller coaster that I was kind of going through. And even though I know I lost the baby, a part of me still was kind of hoping that Maybe it wasn't true, you know, because you're still saying you can, you know, can probably just be body and you didn't lose the baby. So in my mind, I'm still trying to, <laughs> I guess what the word I'm looking for, convince myself and I guess bargain with my, I, I don't know what I'm trying to tell myself as I go through that process, but it's almost like you're in denial. You just don't want to accept it, but it is what it is. And I think, you know, the next stage is just kind of just, um, you're hurting. I am hurting because I wanted this baby so badly. I know my husband wanted the baby. And so that hurt is still there. And finally, when I realized that it's not there, the baby's gone and there is nothing I can do about it. I just decide that it's better for me to trust God and trust this plan, trust the process and pray and hope that we will conceive again and praise God. And I'm thankful every day. I don't take lightly that I'm a mom because I recognize that so many women, this is a struggle for them. Some women have multiple miscarriages. And so, I'm grateful that I can take a step back and say, thank you, God, for allowing me to trust you and trust the process that you are putting me through 
because here I am, a mom once again, three times over. So, but I, I, I experienced all of them. I didn't want to believe I lost the baby. I was angry at myself. You know, I was still hoping that this wasn't true, that maybe the spotting was just going to be a little thing, just like I've heard that some women still spot throughout their, their pregnancy. I was kind of hoping that would be me. You know, I was just kind of hoping. And then the sadness just overtook me when I recognized that I am not pregnant anymore. But then I'm grateful that I can stop and remove myself from the situation and accept that this is the will of God. Thank you all so much for listening in this series this month, all about how we can move forward with different topics and featuring some of our favorite episodes from the Sisters in Lost podcast. Thank you again. Thank you for listening to today's episode. For show notes, go to sistersinloss.com to stay connected with us and join the Sisters in Lost community and receive my weekly newsletter. Please go to sistersinloss.com forward slash newsletter. That is sistersinloss.com forward slash newsletter. Please rate and review this episode and I will talk to you next week.